tonight, the first weekend of Lent, and as we heard last week in the Transfiguration story where Jesus revealed his true nature that had been masked through his humanness. And then on Ash Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday, we heard the story from the Sermon on the Mount about how we are to live into our piety, the, 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 the disciplines of grace, prayer, and fasting, and the things we're supposed to do with that, and our almsgiving, and how we're supposed to do it in secret, because our Father who sees in secret honors what we'll do. Those things were to prepare us, to prepare our hearts for Lent, because Jesus is assuming we do those things. And we talked about, well, some days I just may not have time. You get that? Everybody falls in that boat. That's nothing new. So tonight's story, or tonight's scripture lesson, it's not really a story, it's a scripture lesson. It has some interesting things in it, but we've heard it before. I want to read that, and let's discuss... What all it might mean to us. Let's talk about the different things. Now, I encourage you to hear this under the influence of community memory. Okay, see how many things in your mind connect between what we're going to read and what you know about your faith. We're going to pick up in, in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. So what do we hear in that? I think we've heard that somewhere near a hundred times probably. So Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's just start there. Galilee was north of Judea. Galilee was like the second class territory. It's that county on the other side of the railroad tracks. It's second class. Judea being the first class. I mean, this side of Broward County is the first class. The west side is. I'm just saying. That's how people see things. That's why they saw things in. So from Galilee was the second class. And Nazareth in Galilee was a third class city. So you had a third-class town and a second-class territory. That's where Jesus is from. That's what people heard when they heard Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Did y'all hear that? When it was read, did y'all hear that? No. But that's the truth. The people that heard it the first time or heard it the first several times, they knew that. They understood that. So in our communal memory, that affirms something for us. What might that be? How about the humble beginnings, the way God chose to come into the world through the incarnation. He didn't come the way people thought the Messiah would come, through a noble birth, into a noble lineage. He did come from the, the tribe of the, the lineage of David, but not in a royal setting. He came in a humble setting. And he was born in Bethlehem. Not Nazareth, but that's where he hailed from. Some people heard he was from there. That's, well, third grade, third grade city in a second class territory. That's where it starts. But he came to the Jordan where John was baptizing. And he had John baptize him. Now we know in the other gospels we hear the story about John protesting and Jesus saying, no, it's right that we do this. But Jesus is baptized. And when he comes up out of the water... Heaven broke open. The light shined down and a voice said, You are my son. I love you and with you I am well pleased. He speak, God speaking first person to Jesus. 
And then the Spirit sent Jesus out into the wilderness. So the Spirit landed on Jesus like a dove. Now, I would venture to say Jesus always had a connection with the Holy Spirit. So it's not like he didn't. So what does it mean that the Spirit was resting on him after baptism? Okay. And then the Spirit sent him someplace. What might our communal memory tie in with that? How about when we're baptized into the faith? We're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Most of us don't really recognize that as happening because who of us had a notion of the Holy Spirit before we had a notion of the Holy Spirit? I get that when baptism comes, the Holy Spirit's given just like it was to Jesus, but we don't exactly know what it is. So when it comes our way, we may not recognize it right away. Does not mean it came. It didn't come. It just means we didn't recognize it. And sometimes, just being honest, sometimes we float through life since then, even after having encountered the Holy Spirit, a lot of days we carry on with our days without paying attention to whether the Holy Spirit's there. We jump up, we get busy, we go. We fly through our Cheerios and we hit the door and we're on for the day. Go through our meetings, lunch, afternoon, traffic back home, fly through our mac and cheese, on to the favorite TV show. Now it's time for bed. Maybe we're laying in bed thinking, well, I didn't see the Holy Spirit today. I wonder what that was all about. I wonder what that was all about. You were so busy focusing on the things of the here and now of this world, you didn't stop and connect with God, which should have been the first thing that happened in the morning, maybe even before your feet hit the floor. Recognize God. Good morning, Lord. You ever tried that? Good morning, Lord. Thank you for today. Be with me today. Let me feel your presence today. Let me know your spirit is with me today, Lord. Give me ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to perceive the Holy Spirit being with me today. Then put your feet on the floor and go. See, when Jesus recognized this Holy Spirit came down upon him, it was a different purpose for this Holy Spirit. See, Jesus' life changed with his baptism. See, before baptism... Did you hear that? He was Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. After his baptism, the Spirit sent him out to the desert, the wilderness. His baptism and the voice from God denoted a change for Jesus. The life he had been living up to him, the carpenter's son, doing what he'd been doing, was now over. It was over. Now he's doing something new. Friends, that's the way it's like for us. We get baptized. In, in, in our theology, we understand that we're regenerated. We receive a new heart. We become born from above. We receive the Spirit. We're new people. Our mind is renewed. Our hearts are reborn. We have a spiritual birth. We're supposed to be different people after baptism. Jesus is modeling for us that the old life goes away and new life begins. Nothing changed about the fact that he was from Nazareth, that he was a carpenter's son, but he's no longer doing any of that. That has nothing to do with what he's doing now. You think the wilderness needed a carpenter out there to deal with the wild animals? No. The Spirit sent him out there. For how long? 40 days. Now that 40 days, what's our communal memory tell us about the 40? The wilderness, right? The Israelites, after they went through the Red Sea, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. A time of preparation, a time of change. The people that came through the sea are not the people that went into the Holy Land. The person that went into the water is not the person that came out of the water. 
They remember they crossed the Jordan, so they went through water twice. But we go through water once and we're baptized. Jesus' 40 days is his tying in with the 40 of the years that the Israelites were out in the wilderness. Now we know they went through all kinds of toils and troubles. They complained and whined and carried on and bemoaned and would rather be back in slavery than to live here and die in the desert and all that stuff and picked on Moses, made a calf, got in trouble with God and got the Ten Commandments. Man, they made a mess of everything and so none of them got to go to the Holy Land. So Jesus goes out there and wrestles with, the, with Satan, the devil, wild animals out there. Why do you think Scripture said wild animals? What's that tie into? Maybe Genesis, the beginning, where Adam. But so we understand Jesus to be the second Adam, right? He's going to undo what the first Adam did. The first Adam brought sin into the world by his disobedience. And Jesus is going to undo that by his obedience, even unto death on the cross. So the wild animals are in there to remind us. There was a time when man walked with wild animals and it was safe and it was okay because Adam and Eve lived with them in the garden. These words are in there for a reason, folks. It's to tie us in so we understand our communal memory matters. When we hear these verses, we should understand it means more than just these little words that we read. It's trying to tell us something. You see, in Mark, it doesn't tell us that the, the devil said, make these stones into bread. It doesn't say that he went up on the highest temple and looked down, throw yourself off. It didn't say, if you'll worship me, then I'll give you dominion over all the kingdoms of the earth. He doesn't do any of that in Mark. It just says, for 40 days he's out there being tempted. That's it. Goes out in the desert. Now, who do you think he might find in the desert today? How about us? How about us? Do any of us ever have desert experiences? I do. If none of y'all do, I'm doing it for you, okay? But my guess is, is that everybody in this room has desert experiences. Those times when God just seems far away. I don't seem to be able to do things right. I need to stop and reflect on who I am, whose I am. What am I supposed to be doing here? We, it's a time for us to reflect. Why am I here? Why does it matter? What am I supposed to be doing in this life? You know, those basic existential questions. You know, the same questions that got us to accepting Jesus in the first place. Because we realized we'd made a mess. We couldn't fix it. And somebody told us the good news. The good news. No one sitting in here tonight is sitting here because you did not hear about the good news. Everybody's here because you heard the story of the good news. Even if you're new to Christianity, you heard the good news. And the good news is this. We don't have to continue living the way we were, doing the things we did, causing us and others grief, anxiety, guilt, trouble, broken relationships, can't even keep a job, wreck my car, can't be nice in traffic, I'm angry all the time, I'm anxious all the time, stressed or depressed. All that stuff. We don't have to live that way anymore. That's the good news. That's available to us each and every hour of each and every day, even by the minute. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I'm across that line, then I'm back across the line, then I'm across the line, then I'm back across the line. I'm in and out, in and out. In. One minute I'm in grace, the next minute I'm on my own, by my own choice. But we don't have to do that. See, the good news is that the Spirit has been given to us. So when we are in our deserts, we have what we need, the strength, the power, 
through the presence of the Holy Spirit to resist the sins, the anxiety, the anger. Do y'all know we have the power to resist and overcome those things? Even though we practice them a lot. I mean, come on. Some of us are experts. I was told to Freddie earlier, I'm an expert at worry. And I understand that when you pray, worrying goes away. But what if I want to worry? What if I want to? Does that mean I have to pray anyway? Well, yeah. So, but if I pray, the worry goes away. So what's up with that? Same with our sins, the things we do, the anger, the anxiety, the guilt, the grief, the depression, all that. When we pray to the Spirit, or through the Spirit to God to re relieve us of those things. Help me not be angry. Help me not be anxious. Lord, I'm tired of grieving. When does the grief end? When does my guilt end? It ended when Jesus resurrected. That's when it ends. Y'all know that? That's why our communal memory is so important. To remember what Jesus did. Because some days we go through life and we forget what Jesus did. We're only focused on the here and the now and the mess I got. Or what somebody did to me. I got to drive to Miami for meetings every day this week. Are you kidding me? We'll be stressed all week, down and back. That's what we focus on. Instead of Lord, I know you give me the strength and the ability to drive through that mess and that traffic and come out smiling on the other side so I can be who you want me to be when I get there for whoever's there. And communal memory allows us, and this is one we need to be especially paying attention to because this is what it matters about being in community with each other. How many of y'all know other people in this church body pretty good see a lot of us know other people in here pretty good right when was the last time you told one of those people you know pretty good I am so happy for you I have seen God work in your life over these years and I've seen the changes in your attitude in your actions I've seen how God has walked with you I am thrilled to know that for you. When was the last time you said that to one of these people you know so well that you've witnessed? You've witnessed the changes in them. Did you ever think maybe they need to hear it? Because see, it's possible that you yourself don't see the changes that have happened to you that everybody else that knows you've seen. Now, the people of your faith friends know what it's about. Because they know you went in the water one way, came out the water another way, you went through the wilderness experience of your life, and you came out ready to go and do what God asked you to do. And in the process of doing that, God changed you. He transformed you. He made you into the person He wanted you to be, and He's walking you along a path to be who He wants you to be in the places He's taken you. And granted, sometimes you said no. I don't want to do that, God. That's not my gift. I know that's what you're telling me, but God, I, I know me. Look, it's me. I know that's not my gift. I know you're asking me to do that, God, but yeah, you know, I really don't want to do that. So we said no. And the crazy thing is God won't leave you alone. How many times you got to tell God no? I'm saying that in all due, all due sincerity, folks, because I told him no about ministry for years. And he did not leave me alone. And finally, I realized I'm 50 years old, and I am never going to be happy ever again because I keep telling God no. And finally, it hit me. I don't know if you've reached that point yet, but I suspect you will if you keep saying no where finally God is going to wear you out. And you're going to say, okay. And guess what happens? 
you're okay, turns into a joyful experience. God does for you something you couldn't do for yourself. Anybody ever tried to go to the store, uh, I need a 10-pound bag of joy, absolute joy. I need some bad. I'm going to eat like four big bowls full of it with milk. You can't buy joy, can you? There's nothing you can do. You cannot buy joy. It only comes unbidden through the grace of God. Grace. That unearned, unmerited favor of God where God favors you with a blessing that you didn't earn. You told no 87 times. And you begrudgingly said yes and he blessed you. That's the good news. The good news is God takes away the grief and the anger and the anxiety. He gives you the power to confront it and say no today to it. Now, you've been saying yes for a long time, living in that anxiety and that anger and all that stuff. You've been saying yes for a long time. So it takes a little while to practice saying no, to live into that power to where I don't have to pick up that bottle anymore. I don't have to call the drug dealer anymore. I don't have to go online to gamble anymore. I don't have to go hang out with those people anymore. I don't have to yell at my friends anymore. I don't have to lie, cheat, and steal anymore. It takes a little while of practice and saying no to those things and yes to God. But miraculous things happen when you do say yes to God. You become a new person. You become generous. You become thoughtful. You become purposeful. You start living in the fruit of the Spirit, the gentleness, the self-control, the patience. Ooh, the patience. All those things become manifest in you. That's the good news. The things that you couldn't get, now you have. The things you couldn't buy, now God gives you. The good news, friends. Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near. It's come near. Repent and believe the good news. The way God saved you and saved us was no fluke. It was no accident. It was intentional. Jesus says, spare me from this, but not my will, but your will, Father. I'll do it. I'll be obedient unto death. God's not asking us to get on that cross. He's just asking us to bear the cross of our self-will. Die to self. Die to selfishness. Die to self-centeredness. Die to what we want to do and accept what God wants us to do. And then you don't have to go searching for that 10-pound bag of joy. It'll just appear on your doorstep with an Amazon wrapper on it. Well, maybe it won't have an Amazon wrapper. But God will deliver it to you. There it is. The blessings appear. The relief appears. The guilt goes away. Anxiety's calm. The anger no longer controls you. The pursuit of the material things of this world take a second seat to the generosity that God wants you to have in your heart. You're able to love your neighbor because you're learning to love yourself because you first loved God. Friends, the good news is Jesus came for us. His life changed. He went through a transformation in his life to start living into his purpose just as he wants us to live into our purpose. Being baptized is not enough. Receiving the Holy Spirit is not enough. Receiving the good news and allowing it to manifest in us and then therefore allowing us to show it to others, to tell it to others. That's the good news, friends. Believe. Believe in the good news. You've lived it. Has God touched you and intersected with your life? You have clear, crystal clear evidence of the good news being real. Believe in it. Believe in the good news. This week, friends, as you go about your business, when you wake up, thank you, Lord. Good morning, Lord. Start your day with a prayer. Start your day acknowledging 
who saved you and ask for God to help you see the Holy Spirit every day and let that be your guide through your day as you deal with your anger, your anxiety, your stuff that interferes with your sanity during the day. Believe in the good news. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.